Hey guys, welcome to your chapter 6 review, days 1, 2, and 3. So I'm going to actually review the material with you guys. You are still responsible for actually doing the problems. It is a pretty long packet, but you are getting a day in class to complete this. Now, you will be uh, asked to turn this in on the day of your test. So for those of you that have me on an odd period, you'll be turning this in on Monday. Those of you that have me on an even period, you'll be training this on Tuesday. And you have a good five days to complete it, so I don't want to hear any excuses in reality. Um, so let's get started with day one. We have exponential growth. So these are our word problems. We have four different um, formulas or equations for word problems. And you have to be able to determine when to use which one. So the first two that we have is we have our exponential growth model and our exponential decay model. Now these look a lot alike. Okay, You have y equals a 1 plus r to the t, y equals a 1 minus r to the t. Now remember r is your rate of increase or your rate of decrease, and the plus and the minus is what really is telling you whether something is increasing or decreasing and which one you should use. Okay. Now, key words to look for when you're looking at an exponential growth model, you can see words like growth rate. You can see words like increasing. You can see words like growing. So when you see these words, so when you see these words, you essentially want to make sure that you are noticing what it's talking about. If it's talking about population growth, if it's talking about bacterial growth, if it's talking about the growth in the cost of something, or if it's talking about like an antique that, you know, you bought it for this much and it's increasing in value every year. Um, anything that's really talking about a growth in an amount, you're going to be using your exponential growth model. Okay. Now, as for as far as decay, decay, decay goes, you can essentially do this. It's the same idea. You're looking for a decay rate. You're looking for decrease or getting smaller. So this could be something like the population is decreasing. It could be like the cost of a car is decreasing. It could be the cost of <clears throat> something that loses value as years go on. So we can still talk about the cost of things or money with exponential growth and decay. But notice I didn't mention certain things like a savings account or a bank account, okay, because that's when compound interest comes in. So over here, you're talking about things increasing and things decreasing. As far as your variables go, you have your A, your R, and your T for both of these. Your A and your T represent the same thing. It represents the initial amount of the um, situation. What's the starting amount? And then, of course, T is our time in years. R is our rate of increase for our growth model and our rate of decrease for our decay model, okay? Um, so remember, R is always given to us in, uh, it's, it can be given to us in percent form, but we always have to put it in as, as if in decimal form. So if it's given to us as a percent, we need to modify that to be a decimal. The next two are our compound interest formulas, and these are really key to determine which one to use when. And this is usually talking about when we have a savings account, when you hear, see the words deposit. Um, <clears throat> when you see the words deposit, you're talking about compound interest. When you're talking about a CD, when you're talking about certain savings account, we're talking about compound interest, okay? Now, the way to determine which one to use when is when you are compounding a certain number of times, when you can actually give a value to n, that is when you use the regular compound interest formula, which actually has the n in it. So we have our p, 1 plus r over n to the nt. And we use this exactly when we know how many times that something is being compounded. So if we're told that it's compounded quarterly, if we're told that it's compounded semi-annually, if it's told that we're told that it's compounded monthly, then we can use this compound interest formula. Okay? On the other hand, when we ha see the words continuously compounded or compounded continuously along with deposit, this is our major hint that we should be using our continuous compound interest formula with our natural base E. Okay, so we would be using A equals P E to the RT here, all because of this phrase of continuously compounded here. Now, our definitions for our terms here, okay, for both of these, P is our principal, our initial amount. R is our rate of increase. 
T is our time in years. Our regular compound interest formula also has our N, which again is the number of times that it is compounded. Okay. Um, so those are your word problems. Make sure you read your problems well and thoroughly so that you can decipher exactly which one of these that you need to be using. Okay, so let's move on to day two graphing functions. Okay, day two graphing functions, we're talking about exponential or natural base functions, and we're talking about logarithmic functions. So the keys here is you want to know how do you actually graph them, and then of course which transformations cause the asymptote to change. So let's talk about exponential and natural base functions first. Okay, the easiest way to graph them is to literally just plug in points in, into a table and get your x and your y and then plot points. So you just pick, you know, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. If it's been moved to the right or to the left, then shift your x values as well to reflect the movement of their graph. Um, your asymptote usually starts at the x-axis, aka y equals 0. Your common starting points for your parent function are always going to be 0, 1. This is when you don't have any transformations. It's going to be 0, 1, and 1, comma b, b being your base. And then, of course, what changes our asymptote? Well, k changes the asymptote to y equals k. So instead of y equals 0, it changes it to y equals k, that line right there. Okay. Now, logarithmic functions is what we were getting a little bit confused on because when we first started learning about logarithmic functions, the only way to graph a logarithmic that didn't have a base of 10 or e was to find the inverse exponential function. And we'll talk about finding the inverse in the next section. So we went, we would essentially take our function, find the inverse exponential function, plug in points into the inverse, get the y's, and then flip the x and the y, and graph that as our logarithmic. There's nothing wrong with doing that except that it does take a while, and you have to be able to find the exponential inverse function correctly. Or now we have our handy dandy change, change of base formula. So we can actually take a log base 2 of x, and we can change the base and do, you know, common log of log x over log 2, and actually plug in points directly into our function and get, get our values that way and graph them. Our parent function's asymptote here is our y-axis, aka x equals 0. Okay, since it's x equals 0, that means our h is going to change the asymptote. So whatever our h is in our transformations, that becomes our asymptote at x equals h. Okay, so that was day two with graphing. You have a set of graphing problems there to take care of, and that's all on you. Now let's talk about day three. Okay, so now day three, this is everything else that we've learned about exponential and logarithm. So the first thing that we learned about connecting exponential and logarithmic functions is switching from exponential to logarithmic or logarithmic to exponential. So if we're given an exponential and we have y equals b to the x power, this switches to log base b of y equals x. So again, notice our base from our exponent came right here and was the base of our log. The exponent is what the log equals and what we started off with the y equals is what we are taking the log of. So log base b of y equals x. Okay? And it's the same switch back to from logarithmic to exponential. If I have log base b of y is equal to x, whatever the log equals is my exponent. The base of the log is the base of my exponent. So b to the x power goes right there, and then whatever this is goes right here as what it's equal to. So b to the x equals y. Okay, so you just have to remember that connection there. Now, as I mentioned earlier, as I said, we'll look at finding the inverse here. So if we just take a look at finding the inverse, we have um, number one, change f of x to y. And then we switch the x's and the y's positions. Okay, uh, we change the log to exponential or the exponential to log so that we can actually get, you know, the y out of the exponent or the y out away from the log. And then, of course, we go through and solve. I have two examples here for you that you can look through. And if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me some any questions that you may have. Please make sure you carefully read through them as you are copying them down. Okay. Um, all right. So the product property here. Okay. Log properties. Log properties are very, very important to be able to condense or expand logarithms. So we have our three properties plus our change of base formula. So our 
product property is if we have <clears throat> a log base b of two things being multiplied, so log base b of m times n. This changes to two separate logarithms as we expand it, and it becomes a log base b of m plus log base b of n, so two separate logs. For example here, if I wanted to expand log base 2 of 3 times x, it would become log base 2 of 3 plus log base 2 of x. Similarly with the quotient, if I have log base b of m divided by n now, this is now going to subtract. So I pretty much split them apart again, and notice my denominator goes second. And I split them apart, but now we are subtracting. So log base b of m over n is equal to log base b of m minus log base b of n. So as an example here, if I wanted to expand log base 5 of x over 2, it would be log base 5 of x minus log base 5 of 2. And the last property that we have is our power property. Our power property allows us to take our exponent here and bring it right in front of the logarithm. So if I have log base b of m to the n power, it becomes n times log base b of m. So n becomes kind of like the coefficient of the log. Not kind, it really does. It becomes a coefficient of the logarithm. So for example here, if I have log base 4 of x to the third, I can bring that power that power of 3 to the front, and so this becomes 3 log base 4 of x. When you are expanding, this is something that you need to do before you are completely done. Now, change of base. Change of base helps us a ton, especially if you want to graph logarithms without having to find the inverse. So you want to have change of base down, okay? So if I have log base b of m, and I want to actually plug this into the calculator, then I can just do common log of m over common log of, m, of b, use, making, making sure that we notice that our base is always going to be on the bottom, or we can do our natural log, natural log m over natural log b. So for example, I have a log base 5 of 83. In order to plug it into the calculator, I would just do log of 83 over log of 5, or ln of 83 over ln of 5. Both of these will give me the same exact values. Okay. All right, evaluating logarithms. Okay, so we have to make sure we pay attention to how we're evaluating the logs, whether we're given values. If we are given values, like um, you'll see in these uh, the examples right below the uh, notes here, um, when you're given values, the idea is to expand the logarithm using the properties. So if there's multiplication, expand them in terms of the values that you're given. And then you're going to substitute in those values. You can take a look at your notes for that. We did plenty of examples there. Um, if you're not given values, then you just use your common log or your natural log for and use change of base to get your values. Very simple. Okay. Um, and then we have solving. Okay, so solving exponential and logarithmic equations. If they have the same base, okay, we have similar uh, theorems here. If we have the same base in our exponents, so b to the x equals b to the y, then we can just set our exponents together and get x is equal to y. Again, sometimes you need to rewrite the bigger base in terms of the smaller base, so you have to pay attention to that. Logarithms is a lot easier to notice if you have the same base or not because you don't actually have to mess around with it. If you have log base b of x is equal to log base b of y, then you can set these values here equal to each other and you get x is equal to y and you continue solving from there. Now, if they have different bases or you don't have a log on one side or an exponent on the other side, then you switch to its other form. So you take your exponential and you rewrite it in your logarithmic and you solve that way. And again, you can always choose your change of base here to get a value. If you start with a logarithmic, then you rewrite it in exponential form. And again, you just work your way through it and solve for what you need to solve for. Okay, that's your review, guys. Um, you are responsible for all the problems that you need to do. It looks like a lot, but some of the problems are really quick to do. It's for you so that you can practice and be prepared for your test that will be on Monday or Tuesday, depending on what period you have me. Good luck and uh, work hard and ask questions.